The Gospel accounts provide surprisingly few details of the birth of Jesus. And so, over the centuries, we have filled in the gaps by adding elements that may not be historically accurate. Here, we take a closer look at what a variety of historical sources tell us about the circumstances of this extraordinary moment in the history of salvation. Based on the customs of the time, Mary was about 14 or 15 at the time of Jesus' birth. We do not know how old Joseph was. Some speculate that Joseph was older than Mary and widowed. This is based on a reference to Jesus' brothers who are not identified as Mary's sons in chapter 12 of Matthew's Gospel account. But the term brothers also was used at the time to refer to relatives such as cousins or even members of the same tribe. So, it is possible that Joseph also was young. The exact nature of the event that caused Mary and Joseph to travel to Bethlehem is unclear. There were registrations or enrollments in the Roman Empire in 28 BC, 8 BC, and 14 AD. But there is no historical record of a census or enrollment during the reign of Caesar Augustus, aside from the account in Luke's Gospel. Whatever the reason for the journey, Mary and Joseph, who were both from the lineage of King David, had to travel overland from their residence in Nazareth to Bethlehem, the city of King David. The word Bethlehem means house of bread. The distance between Nazareth and Bethlehem is about 70 miles as the crow flies, but the route they most likely traveled on the roads of that time period would have been about 90 miles. Joseph had family in Bethlehem, so the journey, though a terrible burden for a heavily pregnant woman, nonetheless incorporated some joy and anticipation. They probably traveled on foot, or perhaps with a donkey. Scholars estimate the trek would have taken between four and ten days. When they arrived in Bethlehem, they most likely would have stayed with Joseph's relatives. The term in is commonly misunderstood. The Greek word that Luke uses in his gospel is kataluma, which refers to a guest room in a private house, not a commercial establishment. So it would seem that by the time Mary and Joseph reached their destination, someone else was staying in the guest room of the house where they planned to stay. So Mary and Joseph had to stay in a different part of the home. It was the practice of the time to bring animals into a portion of the house at night to protect them from predators and thieves. There are two possible configurations. In a typical Jewish home of the time, the front area of the house had a dirt floor where the animals stayed when they came in at night. The family slept in a raised part in the back area of the same room. The guest quarters typically would be upstairs or behind the family's sleeping area if there was no second floor. In this configuration, if the guest room were occupied, Mary and Joseph might have stayed in the front area downstairs near the animal. The other configuration was found in homes that were built into caves. Typically, a wooden front was built around the mouth of the cave. This is where the guest quarters would be located. Animals were kept at night in the back area of the house, the cave portion. So if the guest quarters were occupied, Mary and Joseph would have stayed with the animals in the cave area in the back, which also would have been a more private space for the birth of a child. Jesus' birth then was most likely not in an isolated area with only his parents in attendance. More likely, the young family was surrounded by family and perhaps friends sharing the joy of the occasion. The manger in which Jesus was laid was more like a stone trough than an elevated wooden box and may have been built into the wall. There's a beautiful dual symbolism here. Jesus, the bread of life, begins his earthly existence in a feeding place in Bethlehem, the house of bread. The stone manger also foreshadows the stone tomb where Jesus would be laid at the end of his earthly life. Notice that both the manger and the tomb are used because they are close at hand. Each serves as a tabernacle holding the very body of God. In Jewish traditional writings, 
called the Mishnah, it was predicted that the Messiah would be manifested from the Tower of the Flock, which was located near Bethlehem on the road that leads to Jerusalem. There were, in fact, sheep pastured there, but they were no ordinary livestock. These were the temple flocks that were used for sacrifice. Note the deeply symbolic foreshadowing here. The first announcement of Jesus' birth was to the shepherds of this flock. Jesus would become both the Good Shepherd and the Lamb that was slain. According to tradition, when the shepherds arrived, they brought gifts paralleling those of the Magi. The first was a bird to symbolize God, which parallels the frankincense, also denoting Jesus as God. The second was a ball, which represents the orb of kingship. This corresponds to the Magi's gift of gold, which is offered to a king. The third gift from the shepherds was cherries, the color of red symbolizing the blood Jesus would shed. This is echoed in the Magi's gift of myrrh, which was associated with burial. Matthew's Gospel account is the only one that mentions the Magi. We do not know exactly when they arrived or even where they visited the infant Jesus. These were not kings, but wise men, and we don't know how many traveled to see Jesus. The Gospel text simply says, wise men came from the east. Was it two, seven, thirty-six? We simply don't know. The traditional number of three may have developed in association with the three gifts they brought. It was likely a small number of magi, and certainly more than one, since the Gospel uses the plural form to refer to them. The reference to these visitors as kings dates back to the legends of the Middle Ages that depicted them as kings and even gave them names, Melchior, Balthazar, and Caspar. None of this appears in scripture. More accurately, the Magi were a priestly political class of the Parthians, a group of people who lived to the east of Palestine. They were scientists of a sort, skilled in astronomy and astrology, they were not Jewish. Thus, they were the first Gentiles to encounter Jesus.